Okay. Uh, getting stuff set up here. So, uh, can you hear me okay? Just got one person here so far. Hi. Okay. Let's see if we're recording. Uh. All right, um, yeah, so I'll get started here in a bit, uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, uh, <laughs> um, let me know, I'm certainly start uh, talking about things if you came here for a specific Uh. All right. Um, yeah, we don't have anybody on yet, but maybe I'll get started talking about some things. So we'll see if anybody else joins us here. Uh, so, I mean, as usual, I mean, my plans are probably to go over the previous week's work assignment, so maybe discuss that a bit, and or, you know, I'll talk about this week's assignment, so we can definitely um, probably do both of those here. So, this week, we should be looking at recursion. Um, and our assignment's all about writing a couple of recursive functions. Um, so let me see what I said about assignment three here. Um, so, so yeah, the assignment three is a pretty big one, but uh, most people, I mean, mo most people either got it all or, or else were kind of stuck more towards the beginning of it. Um, um, so yeah, I was thinking about maybe kind of pointing out again, for anybody that's uh, watching our help session here. Uh, let me go ahead and open up that assignment three. So, so I did want to make certain that people understood um, the issue that happens if you don't use a reference parameter. So it's a little bit tricky, but I did leave it in there in pur on purpose for this assignment. So for assignment three, Um, oh, I, get, I need to look, I want to look at the solution here. So for assignment three, uh, if you weren't reading closely, um, I mean, some people did do this and, and it causes problems. Um, but, um, the, the assignment description talks about you need to use a reference parameter for a couple of these member functions. So in particular, the first one was the max digits that people ran into this. So if you don't do that, um, I think you'll right away would, would have some errors, um, but they'll be, um, they'll, uh, it'll cause possibly 
somewhat mysterious errors to occur for you. So if I go ahead and change that to just a regular pass by value instead of pass by reference for max digits. Um, your the, the thing about this is that your file will still compile because the tests don't um, so the the signature uh, the, the difference between passing by reference versus passing by value looks the same to the compiler so so you can actually compile the um, assignment three tests like this just fine if we go down here and find the test for max digits, I mean, it, it takes a large integer or it's passing in a large integer's input. And so, yeah, whether you pass it by reference or value, um, kind of um, it'll work either way if you're calling the function like this. So, um, so let me go ahead and clean this and rebuild it here. So as usual, that take a little while. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of talk about what happens here. So um, unfortunately, when you pass by by value, like I just changed it here, a, a copy of large integer is made. So when I call it like this first time in my test with the large integer two, uh, so you have to think about in memory, you end up with uh, your original large integer two and a new large integer is created on the stack basically. And all the values in large integer two are copied into the, the, the copy since we're passing by value, which means you're passing a copy. But when um, you make a copy, that just means you make a copy of the integer and the integer and the integer pointer, and you copy all these values. So the, the copy of the ID, the copy of the number of digits, and, um, and in this case, the copy of the pointer. So basically just the memory address gets copied from large integer two uh, here when we're calling it into other, okay? So, so, so you've, you've got an actual copy of the memory address, but both of those memory addresses, both of the pointers are pointing to the same dynamically allocated memory that was allocated when we created the large integer two here in our tests. So the result will be after we compile it, um, if we run it, um, you'll see some failures. Um, and, and this is a, a, an indication of some kind of a memory corruption. So when you get um, um, things aborting um, and you get these double free corruptions, double free is happening because when we come in here, we, we create a copy, we use the copy to, to find the maximum here. And then when we return from the function, this copy gets destroyed. So the destructor gets called on this. So what do we do on the destructor, the, the, the destructor, we call the delete. And this ends up destroying the, the memory, right, for um, that, that both the other and the large integer two are pointing to. So, so we destroy the memory once, uh, and then later on, after we're done, done running our tests here, uh, we end up destroying the memory again. And so that's that's, what, where the double free is coming from. We end up trying to call this delete or this free on the same bit of memory twice. So, so it's kind of subtle, but, um, but yeah, like I said, I kind of left that in on purpose um, um, for people to maybe uh, buy that. You'll get the same problem if you do the same thing for the, um, the last function, the add as well. So, um, so for add, we're also passing in a large integer, but if you pass it in by value, a copy will be made, and you can also get that kind of double free or, or memory corruption there if you if you leave that in. So, um, so so actually, so another thing that that I'll just kind of mention here, um, I think I I discussed it. Um, there's, there's other ways to deal with this kind of thing. So really probably a better way to deal with this is to create an actual, what's known as a copy constructor. So here, when, when we, um, 
when we do this, it ends up using the default constructor, the, the default copy constructor, because we don't really specify a constructor that takes another large integer. So we've got two constructors, the one that I gave you that takes just a regular integer and constructs a large integer from it, and the other that you guys created that takes an array of integers and, and constructs a large integer. So if, if you create what's known as a copy constructor, a copy constructor takes another of the same type as input, right? So if we did that, we could have made it so that when you pass it by value, it made a copy that we did something different instead of just copy. So by default, it copies all of the, um, all of the, the, the values of your member variables, right? That, that's what a, a default copy constructor does but you can override that so probably a better solution to this would be um, if, if a copy is being made to actually allocate a new set of memory and then to actually copy the digits so we have instead of having um, a copy but they're both pointing to the same dynamically allocated memory we allocate a new set of memory for the new copy being made so so that would be the um, um, probably the better way to handle this if we wanted to make a robust object here. So, um, but um, but yeah. So that was the reason why we needed to pass this in by reference, or um, instead of by instead of making a copy by value. So so yeah, just by adding that ampersand here, and also for add. Um, uh, we, we change how we're passing in. We're not making an actual copy. Since we're not making an actual copy, we don't actually end up calling the, the, the destructor on the object and we don't have the, the problems here. So, um, so that was one thing that I would uh, mentioned about assignment three. Um, so I guess maybe the only other thing, unless um, some people had some questions on it, um, um, I'll just emphasize again, maybe before I uh, um, finish up with the assignment three example here. So, you know, la last week was all about, you know, pointers and also about managing memory, so dynamic memory allocation and, and doing um, our own memory management. So as I discussed here a little bit in our videos last week, um, you know, this is not the kind of thing that, so the, one of the reasons why we use higher level languages like um, Python or, or R or I don't know, uh, um, or more type safe languages like Rust nowadays, um, is that so that we don't have to, you know, kind of get down to the nitty gritty and, and kind of manage memory like, like we're doing here with C++ in this class, right? Um, because lots of times it's, it's not really necessary. If you're not building an application that really needs the performance um, th that you get from, from managing things at this level, um, then, then you kind of make things a lot unsafe for yourself uh, with with no benefit if you don't really need those kind of performance gains. So so yeah, I mean, in, unless you're really building you know data structures or building an operating system or some things like that, um, you know, a lot of times you really prefer to use a higher kind of a higher level language that that you're not forced to make certain that you're doing your memory management correctly. Um, but if you really are building efficient data structures, which is kind of one of the things that we're at least getting a flavor of in this class, you know, it, it pays off to actually manage memory at this level, right? So then you do need a language like C or C++ to do that. So, so, so back to this, my, my kind of second comment about assignment three was, if I didn't emphasize it enough in my videos, the, the general pattern, the, the, the simplest pattern you can do when you're dynamically allocating memory like you were doing in this assignment. So, so we were dynamically allocating an array of digits to manage in order to represent a large integer uh, here. 
So in both of our constructors, we were calling new, right? Um, to, to dynamically allocate this array of integers. So the one that you were given and the one that you created, both of them had to create new, but your constructor is only gonna be called once when you, when you first um, create an object, right? So, so when, when we declare an object of type large integer, that's the only time the constructor is called. So in this case, it calls a default constructor. In this case, it calls the, um, the constructor that takes an integer. Um, and um, for these tests down here, it, it calls your constructor that you created, uh, or I guess this test here, your constructor that you created that takes an array of integers. But in all cases, only one constructor will be called. So the, the normal pattern when you're doing dynamic memory allocation is you encapsulate that inside of a, a, a class like we did here for our large integer class. You allocate the memory in a constructor, in one of the constructors, and then you, you, always, you always wanna make certain that every memory allocation has exactly one place where that memory is deallocated or freed up, right? So that's really what the destructor is for. For, for most object-oriented languages that support classes and objects have an idea of constructors, you know, so, so Java, Python, all, all languages that I know of that support object-oriented programming. You can, you can declare constructors for the class, right? Um, and then you'll, you'll also be able to have destructors where you clean up. So, so a common thing for C, C and C++ when you're cleaning it, well, for C++ uh, objects, when you're cleaning up is that if you're dynamically managing memory, you, you, you call the corresponding delete to free up your, um, your dynamically allocated memory. So. so, you know, I mean, not all cases of, of dynamically allocated memory can fit in that pattern, but, but uh, th this is a relatively simple pattern and lots of them can. And if you do that correctly, if you ensure that all of your um, memory is only allocated in a constructor and then you have the correspond delete in your destructor, you'll be avoiding all memory leakage and you'll also be avoiding all possibilities where, um, um, you know, you're, you're like, you know, like the double free problems, okay? Although like you can see, it, it's, it's not, still it's not, you know, it's, it's not easy. So you have to be careful like, like we did if we're creating copies that, that those copies um, are correctly doing the right thing, which it could be argued that the, the class that I gave you to write is not exactly doing the right thing when we create a copy of our large integer class, right? So there's there's definitely some room for improvement um, that could be done if, if, we, if we wanted to um, expand this class out to make it actually useful, right? So. Um, and yeah, I guess that kind of reminds me. So the last thing maybe I'll say is, is uh, some other things. Um, this is just a preview um, later on, but um, th th I mean, this large injured class could be useful. Um, so there are definitely limitations. So if, if we had to do some calculations like finding um, prime numbers for truly big in integers, right? They, they wouldn't fit into like a standard integer, right? So lots of high level languages give you the ability to um, work with truly large integers, much larger than can fit, than can fit into like a, a standard um, de defined integer type for the machines that we work with, right? Um, but C++ doesn't really have that as a built-in, but you, know, you can get that in like Python, you can get that in R um, and some other languages. Uh, so that, that's really what the large integer class is supposed to be, but uh, we, we would want to have things so that um, not only uh, could we add numbers, but we'd have to add in subtraction and multiplication and division. But the other thing that would be nice, um, instead of doing adds kind of like with a member function like this, it would be nice if we could do things like, um, like large integer result equals large integer one plus large integer two, right? Or large integer result equals 
large integer one times large integer two plus large integer three, um, all of that divided by large integer four. Anyway, an arbitrary arithmetic expression, right? So we're later on going to uh, look at how you do that. So, so again, this is another common thing in object-oriented languages like C++, uh, but in many others. Um, so you can do what's known as operator overloading, right? So we'll be able to, to define operator overloads for operations like this, addition, subtraction, division, um, multiplication. Um, so we can overload those operators and, and basically not only add a new data type to the language like our large integer data type, but also be able to give it some of the um, syntactic ability that you can do with built in data types like built in integers and floats. So, so, so once you add in operator overloading, then you can start doing, you know, things that look like arithmetic expressions with your large integer in, in well, relatively natural kinds of ways, addition, subtraction, things like that. So, so anyway, we'll, you know, that's another thing we'll talk about, not, not this week, but like uh, another week or two from now, we'll get into operator overloading and a few other things. So. Um, all right, so yeah, does anybody so have any kind of questions or thoughts about um, assignment three or the last week's material? I don't know if, I don't know how, I mean, pointers are definitely not uh, an easy topic, nor is memory management. So, so last week's material certainly takes some time to um, make certain that you understand it well and, and have gotten it down, so but we will keep using memory management now um, in our assignments for this class. So, you know, if you're still a little bit fuzzy on this, you know, if, if you're listening to this help session after the fact and, and you're still a little bit unclear about things, you know, keep reviewing it um, and, and, and review the assignment three because you, you will need to keep using it in this class here. So. <clears throat> Um, all right, well, and you know, kind of as usual, I thought um, I'd talk a little bit about the fourth assignment, maybe about recursion in general, so about our topics for this week and, and about um, assignment four. So, so that's why uh, what we normally do on, on Mondays, we'll be reviewing kind of the, the past week's assignment, but uh, Monday and Wednesday, we'll also kind of talk about this week's materials and things, if anybody has questions about those. So, um, so recursion also, you know, is, is definitely not an easy topic. Um, um, so it takes, you, you need to look at um, quite a few examples of it to make certain that, that you understand what's going on uh, and how it works. But it, but recursion is also kind of important for data structures. So uh, we will be using recursive types of data structures and we'll be using concepts of recursion for doing like tree data structures um, and it's useful in understanding how you analyze the performance of algorithms when we get to the analysis of algorithms um, in, in, in various ways. So, so I'm, I'm probably trivializing a little bit here but um, but at its heart, recursion is relatively simple. I mean, it's 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 very similar to the idea of of breaking a, a functional decomposition, so breaking up a problem into smaller subproblems. But for recursion, what you're doing is you break it up into a smaller subproblem that's just a smaller version of itself. So if you can specify the, the bigger problem as a smaller version of its of itself. Um, then you can implement it as a recursive um, algorithm or a recursive solution, right? Um, so maybe I'll look at, uh, there was only kind of one video, although it was, it was a rather long video. Um, so I kind of suggested that maybe you break it up yourself into two different parts, but um,
but yeah, in our example, um, um, we had a couple of functions. Well, actually, we just had two functions in the video that we did as recursive. So one where we find the maximum value in an array using a recursive implementation, and another where we define the po raising a number to a power. Um, so, so the expo the raising to an exponent um, um, function um, as a recursive function. So, um, so, so yeah, the um, um, kind of thinking about your assignment four for this week. Um, so one reason why the example for this week is important is, is basically I am having you do the same thing uh, just with some different recursive functions. Um, so I asked you first to create uh, an iterative version. So by that, I mean a version that doesn't use recursion, that just uses a loop, okay? So iterative or iteration um, is just another fancy name for, for writing a loop, right? Um, so, like, um, so we've seen examples in this class. Hopefully, you've seen lots of examples of, like, uh, searching um, an array in this class and in previous classes um, on programming, right? So, so given an array, um, although uh, we add in a slight wrinkle here, so instead of searching the whole array, we're giving you a begin and end index, right? Um, for reasons, right? But um, so the iterative version, though, is, is you know, we, we can just write a loop that begins at, at the place where you tell us to begin um, and goes to the last va value um, and then just searches, uh, keeping track of. So if you want to find the maximum value, what you normally do is, is you um, uh, keep track of the largest one you've seen so far. And then after you iterate through all that, whatever the largest ones you've seen so far will be the value you want to return. Or, or, or you might want to remember the index where you found the largest value and return the location. But, but in this case, we're just finding the maximum value and, and returning the, the maximum value that we find. So This is a little bit of a trick if you've never seen it, but um, uh, one way to avoid having to have like a, a, a dummy value. So, so we could have done something like to set largest so far to be some really small value, like the, the minimum integer. So, so the, the, the smallest negative integer that you could have, or actually the biggest negative integer. So negative max int, right? So then you would be guaranteed that any value in the array can't be any smaller, can't be any more negative than the negative max int. Um, or, you know, if you want to avoid that, you know, so it's kind of a little bit messy to have to include the proper header file to find what the max int is. Um, so, so a slight trick is, is you, instead of beginning at, at the beginning index, you can, be, you can start searching at index plus one. And then you just say the largest I've seen so far is the one at the beginning index. And then I just search at begin plus one till the end to see if I can find anything larger than that, right? So that's all we're doing for the iterative here. Um, so the recursive specification of this function is, so how, we, we can specify find the, this largest value uh, given the begin and end that we want to search in this, um, um, kind of like this. So, or this is one way. Um, so there's other ways. Um, this is a little bit more complicated. I, I can't remember if I talked about this in the video, but um, a simpler way is, is we could define it recursively that um, our base case would be, let's look at the, let, let's say the beginning value. So if, um, um, and, and, then, and then we look at all the values at begin plus one to end, right? So, so you, we could call ourselves recursively to find the largest value at begin plus one to end, and then compare that to the beginning value, right? 
Um, so that's kind of one recursive definition. Here we do it slightly differently. So um, we, we specify a base case that if you, if you give an, an array of size one, um, so, so yeah, I should probably step back here. So one thing we talked about in the video, so to, to write a recursive function, you have to have at least one base case um, and then a general case where the general case um, is in terms of you know, a smaller version of our um, function that we're trying to write. So the base case, in this case, uh, if, we, if we're given an array that only has one value in it, then we can say, well, the largest value in an array of size one is that value, right? So here, if we ever give it, and, and we could test this, like write some unit tests. So if we give it, ever give it an array where we say search from index zero to index zero, well, then obviously the value, there's only one value uh, in that range. So, so whatever values at index zero must be the largest. Or if we ask it to search from index 10 to 10, it's, it's just going to be that value. So that, that's our base case, right? Um, and then here, so we'll later come back to this. Um, so we'll use this general structure. This is known as a divide and conquer um, recursive algorithm. Um, so if the, if the array is, is more than one in length, uh, we will instead split it in half and we will search the, the, the left half from the begin to the midpoint um, so, so when you call this recursively, this only searches half of the function from begin to the midpoint, and it's going to return whatever the largest value is from the begin to the midpoint. Um, and then we call it also on the second half of the array from the midpoint plus one to the end, right? So both of those are just going to return one result. So, so the, the largest value in the first half of the, fun of the list and the largest value in the last half of the list. And then we just take the max of those two. And that should be the max in the whole original list, okay? Um, and, and again, you know, so kind of convince yourself of, of how that works for recursion, right? Or convince yourself that it does work because eventually, um, so, so let, let's start with a list of size five, right? So if, if, if our list is of size five, that means the ballot indexes are from zero to four. So we, we would, if we want to search the whole list for the largest, we would give it the list and we give it zero and four initially to search the whole list. So in that case, um, you know, begin is not equal to n, so we would calculate a midpoint of two because four plus zero divided by two is just two. And we would search from zero to two and also from uh, three to four, right? But then notice, let, let's, let's take the three to four. So if we search from three to four, again, uh, that's not a base case, but when we split it in, in two, um, three plus four is gonna be seven divided by two is 3.5. So, and this will do an energy division, so I'll give you three. So we'll end up searching from three to three, um, and then you know three plus one, so from four to four, right? But both of those, searching from three to three and from four to four, will both be base cases. So, so in the case when we search from three to three, it ju it'll just return the value at index three. And when we search from four to four, it'll just return the, the value at index four. And then we'll take the max of those, right? So anyway, you know, um, one thing that I think our textbook does, I didn't do it in our video, but um, you know, if it helps you, some people like to draw out trees of the recursive calls that are done, right? So, so starting from zero to four, we would have a tree that, that we call it from uh, zero to two, uh, and when we call it from three to four, and then from three to four, we would call it from three to three and from four to four, right? So that can kind of, a, a tree of the recursive calls can kind of help you visualize how the recursion works. Um, look at it here. Um, so anyway, that, that was one of the two functions. Um,
Um, I think um, maybe I'll jump to the assignment four here since, since it's already past 2.30. So let's, let's talk, start talking about that. So, and again, as usual, jump in if you have uh, this prompt any questions or things about stuff. Um, let's see assignment four here. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this more on Wednesday as usual um, as well. Or maybe I better bring the PDF because there is some math in here. So hopefully the math won't scare you off. So yeah, the first thing I did want to kind of um, um, talk about here uh, is just to make certain everybody understands kind of the problem here. Um, so yeah, I ask you to write two recursive functions. So, so one is factorial, um, which if you've been reading or watching the videos, um, um, I think I give actually some already some solutions for factorial. Uh, but anyway, that, that was the first task to, to write an iterative version of the factorial function and then to write, um, sorry, uh, iterative version, then write a factorial, a recursive version of, of the factorial. Um, oh, and by the way, yeah, if, if you're listening to this, um, so uh, our previous two assignments, we were doing things with classes, but in this, in this assignment, we're back to using regular functions. So, so don't go and try and create like some class or something. So these should just be simple functions, right? So um, factorial iterative. Um, but and like I said, it, it, it should be using this big int. So factorial iterative simply ha and, and also factorial recursive simply has a function something like this. So it takes uh, basically it takes a long long int, but we've given a type def an unsigned long long int because factorial is really only defined for positive integers usually. So that's why it's unsigned. And we wanted to be able to give as big of a result. It really, we can, we have, um, as you'll see, if you look at the test for the factorial, um, you can't really, even with a long, long int, um, you can't end up, uh, so, so the factorial grows real quickly. So you can't calculate factorial for very big numbers of n. So this really didn't need to be a big int, but just for, um, consistency, we, we use kind of big ints everywhere um, in this um, assignment, at least for factorial. So it should have been like that, there we go. <laughs> um, So that was what I was talking about, about, about this big int here um, in the assignment four. So, um, oh, I didn't have it in the assignment description, so maybe I should have. Um, so, you know, if you've never run across this kind of um, notation, the, the exclamation mark is often used to mean factorial. So, but, but that's just um, shorthand for, you know, uh, the multiplication of, of the sequence uh, um, n times n minus one times n minus two, right? So I'm, I'm sure I talked about it um, maybe in my video or something, but, um, but, um, but the, uh, the in factorial, Let's just give an example here. I guess maybe I'll just write it. Uh, I guess I'll just write it here, maybe. So if you want to calculate five factorial, it's, it's five times four times three times two times one, right? Or, or whatever n is. You start at n and then multiply that times until you get down to one or down to two, you know, which because multiplying by one won't do anything. So whichever way you want to think of it, right? So anyway, so for the iterative version, you have to write a loop basically that, that just multiplies those out and 
returns the result. Um, and for the recursive version, though, um, So for the recursive version, the, uh, the, the base case is basically when, um, uh, when n is 1. So if you, if you ask to, uh, to um, calculate the um, factorial of 1, you can return 1, OK? And, and you don't have to worry about you know, doing any error checking. So in fact, we're supposed to be passing a big N. So the numbers shouldn't be able to be negative anyway. So, uh, but, but your base cases could be either zero or one. So actually zero factorial is defined to be one as well, right? So you might want to have a base case of, of you know, if, if, if N is either zero or N is one, or if N is less than or equal to one, just return one, right? So that, that'd be your base case for the recursion. Otherwise, the general case is that you just take n times the, the, the smaller version of the problem is just the, the factorial of, of n minus 1, right? So, so if something can calculate the factorial of n minus 1 for you and give you the result, then you can just multiply by n to get the factorial of n. So that's, that's kind of the basic idea of, of the calculating the um, n factorial recursively here. Um, all right. So yeah, like I was saying, you know, those should just be two regular functions. With basically the same kind of signature, but you need to implement one using a loop. And one using um, recursion. So, um, and then the other, so then after you get that working, uh, so what, one of the reasons why we do in factorial is because so that we can do um, an implementation of um, the counting combinations here. So so I'll probably just wrap this up with this here, kind of give a definition of this. So, so hopefully this is clear enough if you read this. Uh, this is just mathematical notation, but this is a common operation. So, so this is known as like a, a counting combinations or, or, uh, or, or, or in choose I combination. So, um, so if I have in items, you want to, this counts the number of ways there are of, of selecting I of those items from a set of N items. So, you know, some simple examples. So if we have three items like A, B, C, how many ways are there of choosing two items from that set of three? Well, you can choose A, B, A, C, A, D, B, C, B, D, or C, D. So that's what's called three choose two. And there's six possible combinations, right? And here we don't consider B A to be different from A B. So order doesn't matter when you're counting combinations, three choose two, right? Um, and there's a formula that's known that, that will give you what the number of combinations of, of N choose I is, which is this formula. So N choose I, if you want to find out the number of cal calculations, it's N factorial over I factorial times N minus I factorial, right? So that's all this expression is saying here. So if you compute these three factorials um, and, and do the division and the multiplication, then you can get the combinations, right? Because, you know, again, if you plug in three uh, and two here, you know, you'll get three factorial, which is six um, over um, two factorial times one factorial. Um, So 
So, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just noticed that I am, yeah. So, um, the you get six combinations from if you have four, choose two. So, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, if, if you have three, you just have A, B, C. So, you either have A, B, A, C, or B, C. So, there's really only three things. Um, all right. So anyway, yeah, and you can convince yourself for, for three choose two or four choose two, you'll get three and six if you plug those in, right? And this will work in general um, for, for any uh, N and I, right? Uh, I mean, I has to be less than or equal to N, right? Um, and there are some definitions, um, although these make sense if you think about them. So N choose zero. So if I have three items, uh, or let, let's do n choose n. So if I have three items, how many ways are there of choosing three? How many ways are there choosing all the items among whatever number of items I have? There's only one way of choosing all the items, right? And kind of by definition, we also say there's only one way of choosing no items, no matter what the set of the size is, um, what, what the size of your, your set n is here. So, so, so these, these represent your base cases for the recursion, okay? So, so to wrap up here for the assignment four, uh, what you're supposed to be doing for the second part is you're going to do one where you write a function that counts the combinations directly. So this won't be a loop. You'll just be using this formula, and you'll be reusing your factorial function. Um, so I think I said you should use the factorial recursive um, Yeah, although I probably don't really care. So as long as you reuse your one of your factorial functions when you do the count combinations directly, okay? But this should be a relatively small function. You should just be calling your recursive, your factorial function um, three times to calculate these three factorials and then using that to um, make your calculation of the number of combinations of, of n choose i, basically. Although, yeah, so in this case, though, so notice your function signature is that you need two parameters as input. So we're going to be returning a, a big int here still from count combinations recursive and, and directly. Uh, but both of these will take two parameters, n and um, i, right? And again, for simplicity, I, I just asked you to use big ints all around, I think, for these. So, um, yeah, so, so it should take two big int values as its parameters, n and i. So, um, all right, and then to wrap up here, um, so for the recursive case, I've got this definition here. So this is notation, but what this is telling you, that this is the recursive definition. These, these represent the base cases for the recursion. So you have to implement um, a recursive function called count combinations recursive, right? And it'll have the same signature as count combinations directly, uh, but you'll be using this definition and this definition. So th these represent the base cases. So if you're ever passed in, no matter what n is, if you're ever passed in either zero or you're passed in i where i is equal to n, then you know that's your base case, and you just return one in that case. Otherwise, you're going to be you're going to be calling your count combinations recursive um, using this formula. So, so you call you make two calls to count combinations recursive. One of them you call it with n minus i and i minus one. The other one you call it with n minus one and i. And then you add those together, and that's your result in the general recursive case. All right. Okay, um, yeah, so I better kind of wrap up for today. I mean, that, that should hopefully be a good enough start for the, those of you that were here or those of you who are watching this after the fact, right? So, but uh, we'll talk more about this on Wednesday um, if people have questions or I'll maybe go into more details about the the combinations recursive that might be needed, okay? So any questions before I kind of uh, wrap up here? All right. Okay, well, uh, good luck. Yeah, so get started on that. Um, 
assignment four if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, I'll see you anybody. See you guys on Wednesday then.